In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, on this most holy night in which our Lord Jesus Christ passed over from death to life, the Church calls upon her sons and daughters scattered throughout the world to come together to watch and pray. If we keep the memorial of the Lord's Paschal Solemnity in this way, listening to his word and celebrating his mysteries, then we shall have the sure hope of sharing his triumph over death and living with him in God. Let us pray. O God, who through your Son bestowed upon the faithful the fire of your glory, sanctify this new fire, we pray, and grant that by these Paschal celebrations we may be so inflamed with heavenly desires that with minds made pure we may attain festivities of unending splendor through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. All time belongs to him, and all ages. To him be glory and power through every age forever. Amen. by his holy and glorious wounds. May Christ the Lord guard us and protect us. Amen. May the light of Christ rising in glory dispel the darkness of our hearts and our minds. Let's go. sense. Incense goes first. Incense goes first. Okay. Slowly, slowly.
the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. The light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Exalt, let them exalt the hosts of heaven. Exalt, let angel ministers of God exalt. Let the trumpet of salvation sound aloud our mighty King's triumph. Be glad, let earth be glad, as glory floods her, ablaze with light from her eternal King. Let all corners of the earth be glad, knowing an end to gloom and darkness. Rejoice, let Mother Church also rejoice, arrayed with the lightning of his glory. Let this holy building shake with joy, filled with the mighty voices of the peoples. Therefore, dearest friends, standing in the awesome glory of this holy light, invoke with me, I ask you, the mercy of God Almighty, that he who has been pleased to number me, the unworthy among the Levites, may pour into me his light unshadowed, that I may sing this candle's perfect praises.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just with ardent love of mind and heart and with devoted service of our voice to acclaim our God invisible, the Almighty Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord, his Son, his only begotten, who for our sake paid Adam's debt to the Eternal Father, and pouring out his own dear blood, White clean the record of our ancient sinfulness. These then are the feasts of Passover, in which is slain the Lamb, the one true Lamb, whose blood anoints the doorposts of believers. This is the night when once you led our forebears, Israel's children, from slavery in Egypt, and made them pass dry shod through the Red Sea. This is the night that with a pillar of fire banished the darkness of sin. This is the night that even now throughout the world sets Christian believers apart from worldly vices and from the gloom of sin, leading them to grace and joining them to his holy ones. This is the night when Christ broke the prison bars of death and rose victorious from the underworld. Our birth would have been no gain had we not been redeemed. O oh, wonder of your humble care for us, O love, O charity beyond all telling, to ransom a slave you gave away your son. O truly necessary sin of Adam, destroyed completely by the death of Christ, O oh, happy fault that earned so great, so glorious a Redeemer. O oh, truly blessed night, worthy alone to know the time and hour when Christ rose from the underworld. This is the night of which it is written. The night shall be as bright as day. Dazzling is the night for me and full of gladness. The sanctifying power of this night dispels wickedness, washes faults away, restores innocence to the fallen and joy to mourners, drives out hatred, fosters concord, and brings down the mighty. On this, your night of grace, O Holy Father, accept this candle, a solemn offering, the work of bees and of your servants' hands, an evening sacrifice of praise, this gift from your most holy church. But now we know the praises of this pillar, which glowing fire ignites for God's honor. 
of fire into many flames divided, yet never dimmed by sharing of its light. For it is fed by melting wax, drawn out by mother bees to build a torch so precious. O oh, truly blessed night, when things of heaven are wed to those of earth, and divine to the human. Therefore, O oh Lord, we pray you that this candle, hallowed to the honor of your name, may persevere undimmed to overcome the darkness of this night. Receive it as a pleasing fragrance, and let it mingle with the lights of heaven. May this flame be found still burning by the morning star, the one morning star who never sets, Christ your Son, who coming back from death's domain has shed his peaceful light on humanity and lives and reigns forever and ever. Dear brothers and sisters, now that we have begun our solemn vigil, let us listen with quiet hearts to the word of God. Let us meditate on how God in times past saved his people, and in these, the last days, has sent us his Son as our Redeemer. Let us pray that our God may complete this paschal work of salvation by the fullness of redemption. You may now extinguish your candles. from the book of Genesis. God put Abraham to the test. He called to him, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, Isaac, your only one whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him up as a holocaust on a height that I will point out to you. Early the next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey, took with him his son Isaac, and two of his servants as well. And with the wood that he had cut for the Holocaust, set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham got sight of the place from afar. Then he said to his servants, both of you stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go on over yonder. We will worship and then come back to you. Thereupon, Abraham took the wood for the Holocaust and laid it on his son Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two walked on together, Isaac spoke to his father Abraham. Father, Isaac said. Yes, son, he replied. Isaac continued, here are the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the Holocaust? Son, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the sheep for the Holocaust. Then the two continued going forward. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next, he tied up his son Isaac and put him on top of the wood on the altar. Then he reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the Lord's messenger called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he answered. Do not lay your hand on the boy, said the messenger. Do not do the least thing to him. I know now how devoted you are to God, since you did not withhold from me your own beloved son. As Abraham looked about, he spied a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he went and took the ram 
and offered it up as a holocaust in place of his son. Abraham named the site Yahweh Iyere. Hence, people now say, on the mountain the Lord will see. Again, the Lord's messenger called to Abraham from heaven and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you acted as you did in not withholding from me your beloved son, I will bless you abundantly and make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants shall take possession of the gates of their enemies, and in your descendants all the nations of the earth shall find blessing. All this because you obeyed my command. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who are wonderful in the ordering of all your works, may those you have redeemed understand that there exists nothing more marvelous than the world's creation in the beginning, except that, at the end of the ages, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. 
and you lift up your staff and with hand outstretched over the sea, split the sea in two, that the Israelites might, may pass through it on dry land. But I will make the Egyptians so obstinate that they will go in after them. Then I will receive glory through Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and charioteers. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh and his chariots and charioteers. The angel of God, who had been leading Israel's camp, now moved and went around behind them. The column of cloud also, leaving the front, took up its place behind them, so that it came between the camp of the Egyptians and that of Israel. But the cloud now became dark, and thus the night passed without the rival camps coming any closer together all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea with a strong east wind throughout the night, and so turned it into dry land. When the water was thus divided, the Israelites marched into the midst of the sea on dry land, with the water like a wall to their right and to their left. The Egyptians followed in pursuit, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and charioteers went after them, right into the midst of the sea. In the night watch, just before dawn, the Lord cast through the column of the fiery cloud upon the Egyptian force a glance that threw it into a panic. And he so clogged their chariot wheels that they could hardly drive. With that, the Egyptians sounded the retreat before Israel because the Lord was fighting for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord told Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may flow back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and their charioteers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn, the sea flowed back to its normal depth. The Egyptians were fleeing head on toward the sea when the Lord hurled them into its midst. As the water flowed back, it covered the chariots and the charioteers of Pharaoh's whole army, which had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not a single one of them escaped, but the Israelites had marched on dry land through the midst of the sea with the water like a wall to their right and to their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel on that day from the power of the Egyptians. When Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the seashore and beheld the great power that the Lord had shown against the Egyptians, they feared the Lord and believed in him and in his servant Moses. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is gloriously triumphant. Horse and chariot he has cast into the sea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. O God, whose ancient wonders remain undimmed in splendor even in our day, for what you once bestowed on a single people, freeing them from Pharaoh's persecution by the power of your right hand, now you bring about as the salvation of the nations through the waters of rebirth. Grant, we pray, that the whole world may become children of Abraham and inherit the dignity of Israel's birthright through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their land, they defiled it by their conduct and deeds. Therefore, I poured out my fury upon them because of the blood that they poured out on the ground and because they defiled it with idols. I scattered them among the nations, dispersing them over foreign lands. According to their conduct and deeds, I judged them. But when they came among the nations, wherever they came, they served to profane my holy name, because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they had to leave their land. So I have relented because of my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they came. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, not for your sakes do I act, house of Israel, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will prove the holiness of my great name, profaned among the nations, in whose midst you have profaned it. Thus the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God when in their sight I prove my holiness through you. For I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the foreign lands, and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, taking from your bodies your stony hearts and giving you natural hearts. I will put my spirit within you and make you live by my statutes, careful to observe my decrees. You shall live in the land I gave your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Let us pray. O God of unchanging power and eternal light, look with favor on the wondrous mystery of the whole church and serenely accomplish the work of human salvation which you planned from all eternity. May the whole world know and see that what was cast is net down is raised up. What had become old is made new, and all things are restored to integrity through Christ, just as by him they came into being who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who make this most sacred night radiant with the glory of the Lord's resurrection, stir up in your church a spirit of adoption, so that renewed in body and mind we may render you undivided service through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. from the letter of St. Paul to 
to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, are you unaware that we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. For if we have grown into union with him through a death like his, we shall also be united with him in the resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that our sinful body might be done away with, that we might no longer be in slavery to sin. For if a dead person has been absolved from sin, if then we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. As to his death, he died to sin once and for all. As to his life, he lives for God. Consequently, you too must think of yourselves as being dead to sin and living for God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early, when the sun had risen, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. He said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. How is the world different? How are human beings different? Human beings still make war. We still look down upon those who are different from us. We still think first of ourselves, steal, and even murder. There are still worldwide pandemics, earthquakes, and tornadoes. What has changed? Isn't the story of Jesus dying and rising just this? Another story? A story manufactured by centuries to teach us a moral lesson? After all, there are many through the ages who have descended to the underworld and returned, whether it be the ancient myth of Demeter and Persephone, or Orpheus, or Odysseus, or Aeneas, or Hercules, or even Dante. Really, this is nothing new, this descending into the realm of the dead and coming back again. Even medical science today can often bring someone back from death to life. We have AEDs right here in our church and in our school designed to do just this. Put the electrodes on and zingo! Here you go. Zingo is the technical medical term. <laughs> we all learned our catechism, however, so we know how to respond to these questions. We know that Jesus' resurrection was not just the resuscitation of a corpse. We understand that Christians from the earliest days of the church taught that Jesus Christ had a glorified bodily presence. His disciples did not recognize him at first, and so we know there was something different about his appearance upon his resurrection. It was not simply that Jesus died and then was resuscitated as if the apostles had an early version of an AED. We also know that his descent to the realm of the dead was different than that of Persephone or Orpheus or Aeneas or Odysseus or Hercules or even Dante. Because Jesus died. 
He did not enter the underworld by some trickery or by paying the fee to Charon crossing the Styx. Jesus died on the cross, suffered the blows of the soldiers, was crowned with thorns and pierced with a lance. Yeah, we can respond well enough to the question of Christ being resuscitated, and we can explain how Jesus' death makes him different from all those Greek demigods. We can even respond simply by telling ourselves and others that you either believe it or not. After all, isn't it just a matter of faith? You either believe Jesus rose or you don't. Then again, the appeal to faith still does not answer the question of how Jesus' rising from the dead has changed anything. The fact that there is still sin and death in the world would seem to indicate one of two things. Either Jesus did not really die and rise from the dead, conquering sin and death, or his death and resurrection did not accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish. Either his resurrection did not happen or it has no power. Hmm. Then again... Now that I'm thinking about it, has nothing changed? The question we we really need to ask ourselves is whether we believe in things we have not seen and cannot test in the lab. Do we really only believe in things that can be scientifically verified? Do we really believe only that? I bet you not only believe, but know that you love someone, and hopefully you know someone loves you. Do you believe in justice, mercy, forgiveness? Prove it. Prove it to me that those things exist in a lab. So now, that we have firmly established that things exist that we cannot see or verify scientifically, let's look at the resurrection and its effects. Let's look at what the resurrection changed. First, I think something changed for the apostles, didn't it? We can be tempted to think of them as characters in a children's story, But the reality is that we are in possession of many of the 12 apostles' physical remains and fairly well-attested artifacts from their lives, especially the last moments of their lives. And one curious fact, universal to all but Judas Iscariot. After the resurrection and the gift of the Holy Spirit, all of them, including St. Matthias, testified publicly that Jesus Christ had died on a cross and rose from the dead and that they saw him in the flesh, risen from the dead. Big deal, you say, they were the apostles. How do you trust the word of the apostles? However, the fact that all of the apostles professed having seen Jesus alive after he had died on the cross is particularly important because they profess this fact knowing that it would cost them their lives. A person may lie to save their life, but a person does not lie knowing that their lie will cost them their life. This is certainly a strong argument favoring the authenticity of the apostles' claim to have seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Not as a story, but a reality. But what about the power of Jesus' death and resurrection? 
some might want to talk about after-death experiences, dreams, and visions. But I think there is a stronger witness about how Jesus' death and resurrection has changed the world, not just 2,000 years ago, but throughout the history of the world. I think of an Albanian woman named Agnes Gansa, living with and ministering to the dying in the streets of Calcutta. Do we think she did this out of some secular humanitarian goodwill? She did this because she loved Jesus Christ, and she knew that the value of her life was not found in the comforts and successes as defined by the world, but the selfless love Christ showed on the cross. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta knew that Christ had conquered death and the purpose of this life was found in the next life. She united her sacrifice to the sacrifice of Christ and his resurrection every day in the Eucharist. She was changed in the depth of her being by the grace Christ won on the cross and in his resurrection given to her daily at Mass. I think of an Italian man living in the streets of Turin, founding a school for orphans and giving the boys of the street hope and love. Do you think he did this because it was a government program? No. Don Bosco opened his orphanages and schools because he knew that Christ had loved the poor and sick and given his life for him. Don Bosco gave his life not for a principle but out of love for a person, Jesus Christ, whom he already knew had already given his life and risen from the dead. I think of St. Francis of Rome, who gave up her aristocratic heritage and, after caring for her husband injured in battle, opened her home to minister to the starving and the victims of the plague. Where did her call come from? Did it fall from the sky? Was she just a good person? She would be offended by any other supposition than that it came from Christ, who first loved her, gave his life for her, and, and once again, she knew that her life on this earth was but a preparation for the next, because this was the reason Christ died and rose from the dead. She had no doubt. I think of a Turkish man in the fourth century who would secretly pay the dowry for the daughters of a poor man in a culture that would have condemned them to a cruel fate. A man who would become known for his wisdom and selfless love of his people. Did you know they just did a scientific DNA reconstruction of what St. Nicholas really looked like? I think of a wealthy East Coast aristocrat from Philadelphia who founded 50 schools specifically for African Americans and 12 schools for the native people of the Americas. Her entrance into religious life rocked the elite social circles and one Philadelphia newspaper carried the headline, Miss Drexel enters a Catholic convent. Give us seven million. Gives up seven million. Do we really think Catherine Drexel did all this on a social principle? We need not wonder why she did it, because she told us, and I quote, My sweetest joy is to be in the presence of Jesus and the Holy Sacrament. I beg that when obliged to withdraw in body, I may leave my heart before the Holy Sacrament. How I would miss our Lord if he were to be away from me by his presence in the Blessed Sacrament. She did what she did because she knew Christ died and rose. Now, my friends, since I have a good beginning, I would like to go through and recount to you every detail of the life of every saint who has lived through the last 1,987 years of the history of the church and how they've changed the world. Now, don't worry, I will only speak about those who have been canonized, 
or officially recognized by the church, only those. Get comfortable. <laughs> My friends, you and I both know that if I were to do that, we would be here for weeks, if not months. I would have collapsed after the second day. Father Eduardo and Father David would have to come here and try to hold me up. So without a doubt, Christ has already begun to change the world by the grace he won on the cross and in his resurrection, and that comes to us in the sacraments. And so we also know these sacraments bestow a grace and power that may be unseen but has truly visible consequences. We all know that the most powerful forces in the world cannot be measured by any scientific instrument or observed with the eyes or held in our hand and certainly not purchased with any amount of money. Any parent knows that a force exists in this world motivating them in love for their children far beyond what they thought possible. If this force exists, then why do we doubt the force of the Almighty God in his word, in his true presence in the sacraments, and in his church? The power comes not from a good moral lesson, but a relationship of love with a person. A principle is easy to deny. Standing face to face with a person, not so much. The apostles preached Christ's resurrection even to the point of shedding their own blood, to the point of giving their lives. Because they not only believed, they knew without the slightest doubt that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead and conquered sin and death. They were willing to give their lives in order to tell the truth of his resurrection. Because they knew when they gave their life, they would live forever, just as Christ lives forever. Yes, already, but not yet. Jesus Christ has already begun to establish his kingdom, but it is not yet complete. That is true, not yet fulfilled. And it will not be complete until his triumphal return at the end of time. This kingdom will ultimately be established by his power, not ours. In the meantime, we need to do just one thing. We need to decide if our every action will be determined by our belief in Christ's death and resurrection or some other priority the world has given us. Yes, many myths have descended into the underworld and come back again, but Jesus Christ is not a myth. He truly died. He truly rose from the dead, and he truly transformed death into a passage to eternal life. Again, the only question remaining is the one we must answer. Will we determine the path of our life knowing what is at stake? Knowing Christ died and rose again? Knowing that the purpose of this life is determined by the next? Or will we have other priorities? Resurrects it, secret dixit. Alleluia.
Let us stand together. Dear brothers and sisters, let us humbly beseech the Lord our God to bless this water he has created, which will be sprinkled upon us as a memorial of our baptism. May he graciously renew us that we may remain faithful to the spirit whom we have received. Come a little closer. Lord our God, in your mercy, be present to your people who keep vigil on this most sacred night and for us who recall the wondrous work of our creation and the still greater work of our redemption, graciously bless this water. For you created water to make the fields fruitful and to refresh and cleanse our bodies. You also made water the instrument of your mercy, for through water you freed your people from slavery and quenched their thirst in the desert. Through water the prophets proclaimed the new covenant you were to enter upon with the human race. And last of all, through water, which Christ made holy in the Jordan, you have renewed our corrupted nature in the bath of regeneration. Therefore, make this water be for us a memorial of the baptism we have received, and grant that we may share in the gladness of our brothers and sisters who at Easter have received their baptism. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, through the Paschal Mystery, we have been buried with Christ in baptism so that we may walk with him in newness of life. And so now that our Lenten observance is concluded, let us renew the promises of holy baptism by which we once renounce Satan and his works and promise to serve God in the Holy Catholic Church. And so I ask you, do you renounce Satan? I do. And all his works? I do. And all his empty show? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do. And may Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed on us forgiveness of our sins, keep us by his grace in Christ Jesus, our Lord, for eternal life. Amen. Amen.
We will this evening be receiving two members of our community into the Catholic Church, and so I'd like to invite forward Stephanie Dorn and Bob Zollner. Stephanie and Robert, of your own free will, you have asked to be received into the full communion of the Catholic Church. You have made your decision after careful thought under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I now invite you to come forward with your sponsor and in the presence of this community, you have professed the Catholic faith. In this faith, you will be one with us for the first time at the Eucharistic table of the Lord Jesus, the sign of the Church's unity. Stephanie and Robert, the Lord receives you into the Catholic Church. His loving kindness has led you here so that in the unity of the Holy Spirit, you may have full communion with us in the faith that you have professed in the presence of his family. Now I'd like to invite Brian Dorn forward for the reception of the Sacrament of Confirmation. My dear candidates for confirmation, the promised strength of the Holy Spirit, which you are to receive, will make you more like Christ and help you to be witnesses to his suffering, death, and resurrection. It will strengthen you to be active members of the church and to build up the body of Christ in faith and love. My dear friends of our community, let us pray to God, our Father, that he will pour out, on the, pour out the Holy Spirit on these candidates for confirmation to strengthen them with his gifts and anoint them to be more like Christ, the Son of God. All-powerful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by water and the Holy Spirit you freed your sons and daughters from sin and gave them new life. Send your Holy Spirit upon them to be their helper and guide. Give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of right judgment and courage, the spirit of knowledge and reverence. Fill them with the spirit of wonder and awe in your presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. John, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Let us welcome him to our community. Now let us offer our prayers and petitions to our loving Father in heaven. the resurrection of Jesus Christ will endow the church with new life. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. That those baptized and confirmed this holy night will flourish in their faith. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. That the graces of the resurrection will enlighten the minds and hearts of all civil leaders. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That the sick 
and those who suffer will experience in their bodies the victory of Christ's empty tomb. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have died will share in the glory of the Lord's resurrection. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the intention of this Mass, which is the newly baptized, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you grant all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the grace and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all of his holy church. Accept, we ask, O Lord, the prayers of your people with the sacrificial offerings, that what has begun in the Paschal Mysteries may, by the working of your power, bring us to the healing of eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but on this night, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying he has destroyed our death, and by rising restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, Benedict, our Pope Emeritus, and Ronald, our Bishop, and all those who hold to the truth and on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you, for them we offer you this sacrifice of praise. For they offer it for themselves and all who are there to them for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying him homage to you, eternal God, living and true celebrating the most sacred night of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially with the glorious super Virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Lynn, Gladys, Clement, Sextus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you also for those to whom you have been pleased to give the new birth of water and the Holy Spirit, granting them forgiveness of all their sins. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the, most, the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, 
broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when the supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save our Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. Therefore, o Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel, the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with a sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Pour out on us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, and in your kindness make those you have nourished by this Paschal sacrament one in mind and heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. It's uh, wonderful to be able to celebrate with you because if you remember last year at this time, there were paper cutouts with pictures of you in the pews. And so uh, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate with you. Of course, everyone who's watching at home, everyone over in the Parish Life Center as well. Um, and uh, thank God that we have large, musically gifted families. And so we can actually have a choir. So thank you to Dr. Rasmussen and our choir and our musicians. And it's great that we have a ringer who is related to choir members and grew up here in the parish. So thank you to Father David Mowry for sharing his beautiful uh, voice with us as well. And all of our altar servers and ministers, all those who were here uh, late at night decorating, uh, early in the morning decorating, say, setting up all of those who have made our liturgy happen, even our camera people who you don't see, we keep them locked up in another room. So thank you to everyone who comes together uh, to make these uh, liturgies and have made these liturgies uh, so beautiful. And uh, we do have uh, a couple of announcements because that's what we do at parish masses. Um, and so please, the candles that you received at the beginning, please take those home with you. That is our Easter gift to you. And that saves us having to chase them down through the pews in the church. Um, there is also uh, some uh, Easter water that has been blessed and that is available. You are free to take a bottle, one per family. Uh, they are in the bottles here up in the front of the church by the baptismal font. Feel free to take one of those bottles with you. And then, of course, there are collection baskets at the exits of the church in the Parish Life Center. And just on behalf of all our, our priests, deacons, and staff here at the parish, we with you, wish you a truly blessed Easter and Easter season. The Lord be with you. And with, with your, spirit. your spirit. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May Almighty God bless you through today's Easter solemnity and in his compassion defend you from every assault of sin. Amen. And may he who restores you to eternal life in the resurrection of his only begotten endow you with the prize of immortality. Amen. Amen. Now that the days of the Lord's passion have drawn to a close, may you who celebrate the gladness of the Paschal Feast come with Christ's help and exulting in spirit to those feasts that are celebrated in eternal joy. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.